Joe, I've been really interested in what constitutes the self. How do we have a sense of personal identity? How, do, how, how are we the same person we, that we were when we were five years old? Not a single molecule in our body probably is the same. What makes us? And I've been talking to philosophers about the nature of the continuance of personal identity. But as a neuroscientist, putting aside all the philosophy, how do you look upon the nature of self? Well, I, I tend to view it a little different than most philosophers, but usually when we talk about self, we have things like you know, self-identity, uh, self-concept. We think of the conscious self. But as a person, we're much more than what we're conscious of, obviously. So our self, to me, extends way beyond what we're, you know, our self-aware conscious self. And so that's what I tried to get at in my book, Synaptic Self, which is the implicit nature of much of, of who we are. And the key idea is that there are, uh, that synapses are involved both in, in the parts of ourself that come to us through our genetic heritage as a member of a family and species and so forth. So you have certain traits you acquire from your parents and so forth. Um, but also that experience alters synapses, and that's how we learn and store information. So the reason we're the same person from day to day, week to week, and year to year, is because we have some things that are just sort of burned in by evolution or by, by uh, our family history, uh, but other things that we've acquired through experience that are learned and stored in our brains through synaptic modifications. So and that's the, the area between the neurons which can change based upon experience, and so the learning and the changes in the the, the encoding of what is unique about ourselves would be in the spaces between neurons, the synapse. Right, so everything we, we learn involves synaptic change, synaptic plasticity as it's called. Um, but you know, a synapse is such a small, tiny thing, and there are tens of thousands of them on a single neuron. Our personality is spread throughout our brain. So it's almost you know, mind-boggling to, to think about how our personality can be represented in our brain. We need a whole new way of thinking about the brain that can account for this, because usually we study things within a system. So within the visual system, within the auditory system, within the memory system, within the emotion system. But we're not perceptions, memories, or emotions, but somehow an integration of these. And this requires that we start understanding uh, the brain across, sort of horizontally rather than vertically. So we do a lot of research on individual systems, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we now we need to start understanding how the systems interact. One of the most important kinds of research to understand what a self is are those cases where the self is disrupted, particularly in the split brain experiments that uh, were done because of trauma or because of the need to do that because of epileptic conditions. You've worked on this, you've been one of the pioneers. Uh, what have we learned from split brain experiments about the nature of self? Yes, I was very fortunate as a graduate student to have the opportunity to study a select group of those patients. And I did almost all of my dissertation work on one patient who was really unique amongst all of those split brain patients. Um, he was unique because he had the capacity in his right hemisphere to comprehend language, mm. unlike almost all of the other patients. That meant that- Who have it in the left hemisphere. Well, he had, it in, he had the capacity to read in both sides, but the capacity to speak only on the left, as mm. most people do. So in the problem with assessing consciousness in the right hemisphere is usually that you can't communicate with it, right? It's kind of like, you know, a, a chimpanzee or something, because you know, there's no like human communication. But here you had the opportunity to put sentences into the right hemisphere and have the right hemisphere answer them, answer questions, for example. So like we would, if you flash information to the left side of space, that will go to the right hemisphere. So we ask the right hemisphere, who are you, with a quick flash, so it goes to the right hemisphere. And then we had a, a bunch of Scrabble letters and the left hand connected to the right hemisphere pulled out the name Paul which is his name. So the right hemisphere in this patient had a sense of self. It, it knew who he was. Uh, then we asked the right hemisphere, what do you want to do when you grow up? And the right hemisphere wanted to be a race car driver. The left hemisphere, on the other hand, wanted to be a draftsman. So here you have two different, you know, both sides know that it's, their name is Paul, but one side wants to be a race car driver and the other side a draftsman. So you can begin to see the conflict. Now what's interesting about these patients is that you can put 
you can give commands to the right hemisphere through these because this patient had language in his right hemisphere and could comprehend inf the information. So you could say, stand up. So you flash the word stand up. So the patient stands up. So why did you do that? Now you're talking to the left hemisphere because mm -hmm. only the left can talk. So, well, I needed to stretch. So, um, so you flash wave. So left hand waves. Why did you do that? I thought I saw a friend. Uh, flash the word rub. He does this. So, so why did you do that? I had an itch. You know, so each time the right hemisphere was generating an, I'm sorry, the left hemisphere is gener generating an explanation of information, of behaviors that came out of, from its perspective, an unconscious system. Right? And this is how Mike Zaniga developed his theory of the interpreter. Mike was my PhD supervisor, and he went on to focus on these conscious processes like the interpreter uh, in the left hemisphere, which interprets behaviors that are generated unconsciously. I went on in my own research to study the implicit or unconscious aspects, especially the emotional aspects of information processing and how those might live underneath the level of consciousness. That's so fascinating. In fact, it gives some biological substrate to some of the theories of Freud and others that talk about the, uh, the power of the unconscious to, to give uh, conscious behaviors that the consciousness then makes up stories right. why it occurred. Yeah, so the, the Freudian unconscious is different from what's called the, you know, the, sometimes the cognitive unconscious, but we might call it psychological unconscious to include emotion in that. Um, so for Freud, things became unconscious because they were once conscious and so anxiety provoking they had to be shipped away. Yeah. The cognitive or psychological unconscious is information that's unconscious simply because it's not part of consciousness. A perfect example of that is the way the amygdala uh, processes information. This is the part of the brain I work on in terms of emotion and fear in, in particular. It can receive information and produce emotional responses and even learn independent of what the neocortex is doing, which is required for consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the amygdala is an unconscious emotional processor and an emotional learning system uh, that lives below the, the uh, radar of consciousness, not because it's was anxious and you know, the consciousness shipped the amygdala down below. It's just, that's just where it is and right. it, uh, the consciousness doesn't have access to that. It's in the normal course of, of, of structure. That's right. its normal behaviors. Right. But what's fascinating in, in that example is, is that, is that the, the, the side that can talk, that saw behaviors, it, 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 it was forced to come up with its own explanation and since it didn't know why it happened, right. it came up with something that was rational within its own sphere of, of, uh, of knowledge. That's right. That's what philosophers call the uh, narrative theory of consciousness, and uh, Mike Zaniga called this the interpreter function of consciousness. Mike proposed that it was a left hemisphere verbal linguistic function. Obviously, we need language to form the concepts and to extrapolate from our behavior into more complex concepts of why we're generating those behaviors. And on the basis of these stories that consciousness makes up, we develop a sense of self and purpose, and uh, that kind of keeps us going from day to day, month to month, and year to year, at least consciously. <laughs> consciously. It's not the whole story because there's a lot underneath that uh, makes us who we are as well. But it's certainly in terms of how we are, the person we are consciously, um, the, the interpreter idea, linguistic encoding, narrative idea is very important.